All right, all right. Thanks for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Martin Wilson, and we have another fantastic show for you today. I have Dr. James White with me of Alpha and Omega Ministries, and we are going to be discussing and have a fantastic discussion concerning the anti nicene Trinitarian doctrine. What's it about? How did it get started? What was what was going on during that time in church history that this was a prominent view or somewhat of a view that took place prior to the Nicene Council. But I, uh, before I bring Dr. James White in, I do want to make sure you know to subscribe to The Gospel Truth and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any shows that are coming up here on The Gospel Truth. You don't want to miss out on any shows, interviews, or commentaries or debates. So make sure you do that. Hit the subscribe button. Also, if you don't know, all this content is not only on YouTube, but it's also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. So make sure you flow over there as well to subscribe, follow on those social media platforms. All right? And also, all this content is also on podcasts. I have a couple of shows I need to update uh, the podcast. So I got it right now. It's on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. So make sure you flow over there to those podcasting platforms and subscribe to The Gospel Truth. All right? With that said, as always, I do have some shows that are coming up here in the future that I want you guys to be aware of. All right. I have a debate coming up, and this is going to be concerning open theism and the Bible. I have Chris Fisher, and I have Matt Slick, who's going to be joining me. They're going to have a fun-filled discussion with this subject matter so i pray and hope that you'll be able to join me and all those guys as well also after that matt slick will be joining me back to back weeks here engage with the uh, open theist chris fisher and also uh concerning monarchianism or oneness theology and it'd be uh it'd be matt slick andrew rapaport it'd be caleb and daniel who is going to be jumping on in a two-on-two debate concerning once again monarchianism and the godhead so let's have fun with this one hope you can join us on that one as well and coming up after that i have jp uncut and i have um Mr. Oscar Dunlap. Now, Dr. James White is very familiar with Oscar Dunlap, and he'll be jumping on with me, uh, with uh, with me, uh, JP and Oscar, concerning can we lose our salvation? All right, this is going to be a fun debate as well. So I hope you guys are looking forward to this one as well. And after that, I have Albie Alts versus Stacy Tuberville. Uh, is the father and son do they sh- say do they share the same nature? So we have a whole bunch of debates that are coming up here in the future, and I am excited. Uh, and I pray once again that you'll be able to join me and my guests during those debates. So I hope you guys hit that subscription and uh, notification bell. All right. With that said, once again, I have Dr. James White with me with Alpha and Omega Ministries. Uh, there is really no large level or mag- uh, um uh, high level introduction that needs to be taking place with Dr. James White. Uh, Dr. James White. Um, this is my first time really talking to him per se face-to-face and dr james white is a theological he- hero of mine like uh, i really look up to dr james white in many ways so um and i'm sure he hears this a lot uh so it's sort of almost like he's sort of used to it i like to think but um i really appreciate him coming on the gospel truth so guys in the live audience i really hope that you treat dr james white with respect and also take consideration that dr james white is doing a lot right now. He's has several debates. He's already participated in two debates. And so there's a whole bunch that he's doing right now. So um, let me bring Dr. James White in so we can get this thing going and have some fun concerning the Antinicene Trinitarian Doctrine. How you doing, Dr. James White? Well, we're here, uh, as you said, uh, really busy right now, 35 day road trip. Um, I don't I don't fly anymore. Uh, we can get into that if you want to, but um, uh, I drive with a, a fifth wheel and I'm sitting in that fifth wheel right now. It's the only fifth wheel that I know of in the United States with a two camera 4K studio uh, in the unit. We, we took the uh, bedroom out and I'm sitting pretty much where the bed would be right now. And uh, <clears throat> that way we can do the dividing line and uh, all the other things that I do while I'm traveling. I sleep in the, the bunks in the in the back. And uh, we're doing a 35-day trip, um, four debates in Houston. We already did two debates with Trent Horn on uh, Soul Scriptura and uh, Purgatory. I have a debate tomorrow with Jason Breda on uh, Limited Atonement uh, here in uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee. And uh, then I'm going uh, to teach at the seminary, Grace Bible Theological Seminary. I'm teaching Baptist Church History uh, next weekend, it's an intensive course that's all day Thursday, all day Friday, and half day Saturday. 
if you think that's rough on the students, you ought to try to be the professor. Um, yeah, I it's imagine. absolutely. Um, and then I'm going to uh, do some speaking on Roman Catholicism in uh, Tyler, Texas. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what happened in Tyler and the mm. removal of Bishop Strickland uh, by Pope Francis about two months ago or so. Uh, but I was speaking in that area. That's that's gotten a lot of non-Catholics really interested in what's mm. going on with Francis. And there really is a <clears throat> a massive crisis within Roman Catholicism right now with Francis, Tucho Fernandez, things like that. Then I go back to uh, Houston, same church. Give them kudos. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing more debates than you are, uh, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll be debating Leighton Flowers on Thursday. I think it's the 7th. <clears throat> and then debating uh, Dr. Dale Tuggy on the 9th. Um, and then I get to go home, what's left of me uh, at that point. Um, but we have more debates coming up. Uh, we, I, I was hoping to be able to make an announcement tonight about Two more debates in Louisiana in April, but we haven't gotten final word on that. They're dragging their feet big time. Um, but uh, yeah, we're keeping uh, we're keeping busy, and I figure I only have a few. Uh, you know, how many more years do I got left? I don't know, but um, I I'm at uh, by the end of all these debates, I'll be at 189. So mm. uh, 11 more debates, and then I can retire. Oh man! So you got? Are you really going to hang it up, Doctor White? You really, you really consider and hanging it up the debates, the, the debates, man? I will, I will, um, I hope and pray, and have been praying quite some time, that the people around me, um, my fellow elders at Apologia Church, uh, you know some of them, you know Jeff Durbin, yep. uh, mm -hmm. you know Oscar, you know, and you, if you've if you've talked with Oscar, you know that it was an online debate that I did uh, with um, uh, Elder Raka in amongst the black Hebrew Israelites yeah. that uh, started him uh, on his journey to faith. Um, he's just a wonderful guy, uh, a yeah. great uh, deacon in the church and uh, just a huge heart, a great, great guy. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm hoping that the people around me uh, will tell me when I can't do this anymore, um, mm. when it becomes obvious. Because look, in sports, how many times do we see the greatest go one or two seasons too long? Yeah. And then it's sort of sad to watch them just sort of falling apart. Um, doing moderated public debate is um, uh, stressful and challenging. And uh, you eventually just get to a point where it's better to let the younger people uh, do that kind of stuff. So... We'll see. I'd like to get to 200, um, but, you know, that's that's totally up to the Lord. Maybe, who knows, 250. Um, but uh, we started in August of 1990, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's been a very fascinating journey. There was no internet. Uh, there was no YouTube. Uh, there was no, none of that kind of stuff. And so debates were of a different uh, essence uh, back then than they are now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, we're praying for you, Dr. White, man. Um, as I said prior to bringing you in, uh, you have definitely played a major part in my theological growth over the years. Um, I grew up in the charismatic church. I grew up in the more, you know, charismatic Pentecostal type of vibe uh, within my church. And it was it was you, Voodie Bauckham, Paul Washer, all those guys who are, you know, pretty much faces of in some capacity reformed thinking reformed thought um played a major part and so i'm extremely thankful for you uh for what you've done not only for myself but everyone that's out there uh that listen to you and find uh your teachings and your ministry to be extremely helpful in your growth in christ so i just wanted to give you some love there uh shower some some uh some grace to you in that in that capacity man and really do appreciate it I appreciate that. And it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> back when I was still traveling overseas a lot, uh, I think it was about 2018. Um, I, I was going to South Africa every year and Zambia is not that far. And so one year I got to fly up to Lusaka and spend time at the African Christian uh, college there with, uh, with Vodi. And he tried to set up a debate with one of the imams there in mm. Lusaka. And the week before we were supposed to do it, 
the imam backed out. And oh. so uh, Odi role played uh, the Muslim <laughs> position. Okay. And I'll never forget sitting there and I'm, I'm the, the, the desk was real close to the podium and I look up and if you've met Vodi, he's a mountain of a man. Okay. He's, he's big. <laughs> and I'm just looking up at this each guy is next to me who's role playing the Muslim. And, uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. And by the way, uh, I preached at Grace Family Baptist Church Sunday morning, which was Vody's old church there in Houston. So, mm. um, yeah, Vody's a great guy, and uh, I'm glad we've all had something to do with with uh, being a blessing to you. Yeah, thank you so much. So we are here to talk about the anti-Nicene Trinity. Now, um, obviously, I'm going to let you go in a little bit about where did all this come from? What, what was going on prior to the, the Nicene Creed? What was going on during this time to where we now have sort of a category, categorization of what the, the pre and post Nicene Creed, what was going on during that time? Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the, I, I know I have a real nice background that I've used in my office a few times because I have the 38 volume uh, early church fathers set uh, along this, this one uh, this one shelf. And I know you can get those all electronically, but they don't look nearly as nice as the books do. I can assure you of that. And when you think about how those are er arranged, they're arranged as anti-Nicene, Nicene, and post-Nicene. So obviously the Nicene Council in 325, and by the way, uh, I tell everybody, if you ever take a church history class from me, uh, one of the questions will be, when was the Council of Nicaea? So just memorize 325 and you've got a few extra points just right there. Uh, but clearly the Council of Nicaea is a watershed for many, many different reasons. Most of the time it's a watershed uh, because of the fundamental shift in the relationship between the church and the Roman Empire. Um, and so I, I, I want to in some of our time tonight, do something that normally gets missed in online debates um, and things like that. The only way to meaningfully address the doctrine of the Trinity as it uh, finds different ways of expression um, is to do some church history, to know something about what was going on in that time period, and also to ask the question, why do we believe in any of this? Why, why, why believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? That's actually somewhat of a argument, even amongst reformed people right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're aware, but for about two years now, I've been in a bit of a, a ongoing struggle, um, controversy with people in my own, I mean, within my own camp, Mm -hmm. uh, fellow Reformed Baptists, and the issue has been going to what is the source, what is the foundation of our theology? Um, what, you know, what, why, why do we believe what we believe? Is the Trinity, for example, a biblical doctrine, or is it not a biblical doctrine? Is it a doctrine of tradition? Is it a doctrine that develops over time? These are all important questions that I seriously think uh, Christians need to be need to be aware of and to think through for themselves, because unfortunately, um, well, you've heard me say, I'm sure over the years, uh, mm -hmm. when people ask me, what classes did you take in Bible college and seminary that were the most important in preparing you for the apologetic work that you do? And the answer to that question is is really it's really simple. Uh, Greek and church That's history. history. Yep. <laughs> um, Greek because, uh, you know, I'm not saying Hebrew is unimportant, but the vast majority of issues that are raised in apologetic context, whether from atheists or Mormons, whatever else it might be, are in the New Testament or in the New Testament's quotation of the Old Testament. And that's from the Greek Septuagint anyways. So mm -hmm. Greek and then church history. And I'm professor of church history at Grace Bible Theological Seminary. 
And I've been teaching it. The first class I ever taught after I graduated from seminary was church history. And I thankfully in seminary had a professor that passed on his love for the subject to me. I don't know if you've ever taken a class in college or graduate studies or something like that. You can tell when the professor loves the subject or whether they're just teaching it. Mm -hmm. And I had a professor who loved the subject, who had done some traveling in Europe, and he, he infected me with a, a love <laughs> for, for church history. And I've tried to pass that on to people for a, a very, very long time now. And so most evangelicals, though, um, do not have a grounding in church history at all. If you were to ask most people attending our churches, you know, what century did Ignatius live in? They wouldn't know the difference between Ignatius of Antioch, who dies 108, and Ignatius Loyola, uh, the mm -hmm. founder of the Jesuits at the time of the Reformation, 1500 years later. Um, and so as a result, people can really be troubled by questions that shouldn't really bother them at all. When it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, um, if you've seen my book, The Forgotten Trinity, uh, then you know that the book starts off with an unusual discussion for a, doc, a, a book on the Trinity. And that is, I, I pointed out that you'll hear people all the time saying, I love um, prophecy. Mm -hmm. I love the prophetic books of the Bible. Um, uh, you know, there's prophecy conferences all over the place and things like that. And you'll hear people saying, you know, I love uh, worship and things like that. What you almost never hear mm. is someone say, I love the Trinity. Yeah. And I started off by saying my, my goal is by the end of this book um, for you to love the Trinity and to recognize that this is, this is something God has given to us. He has revealed to us uh, so that we can know him and worship him. And it is a biblical doctrine. So uh, it didn't seem overly controversial to me in 1997 or so when I wrote those words to call yourself a biblical Trinitarian. It has become controversial since then in my own circles. Mm. I haven't changed my views. I've not been right. given any reason by anyone to think that I should. Um, but fundamentally, I believe in the doctrine of Trinity because I am forced to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity by three biblical teachings, by monotheism, the fact the Bible teaches there's only one true God, by the fact that it teaches there are three divine persons, Father, Spirit, does not confuse them, clearly distinguishes them from one another. There's personal communication, use of personal pronouns, all the stuff that you'll have going on in the oneness uh, uh, debate that you mentioned earlier. <laughs> and which I started doing back in, I think, I think my first oneness debate was in 99, if I recall correctly. Anyway, uh, with Dr. Sabin of the United Pentecostal Church. And then thirdly, the quality of those persons, hence the deity of Christ, the uh, deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. These are the three biblical doctrines that when you accept sola scriptura, the scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. And you accept tota scriptura, that scripture, that you need to believe all of scripture. Um, when you believe those things, you will be brought to the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the foundational elements. Now, what about developments, for example, in what's called post-Nicene Orthodoxy, when you get to um, past Athanasius into uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Nazianz, and uh, Basil, uh, these individuals, what about all the, the language that they utilized and is not found in Scripture? It, how do you explain what happens between um, the last writing of the book of the New Testament, whichever book that was, I doubt it was Revelation, but you know, maybe one of the epistles or something like that. How do you get from there to the rather complicated, often mm -hmm. philosophically based definitions that flow out of 
the Council of Chalcedon and what's called uh, post-Nicene Orthodoxy. And that, I guess, is somewhat what we'll be talking about, at least a little bit of that this evening. But I think it's vitally important because, see, Marlon, for me, the Trinity is not just an issue to debate. It's not something to be prepared to uh, go after the Mormons on or the Jehovah's Witnesses on or something along those lines. And I, you know, I understand maybe when I was younger, uh, it, it had an element of that. But at my age now, uh, having pastored for, you know, I've been in ministry over 40 years now, we just celebrated our, our 40th anniversary of Alpha and Omega Ministries. Um, I have come to understand, and especially, and I'm very thankful for this, uh, as one of the pastors of Apologia Church, that the doctrine of the Trinity is central to how we as believers worship God, how we pray, how we make application of divine truth. If God has seen fit to reveal himself so that we can know him truly, then to know him in that way is to ground believers to give them that solid foundation. And Marlon, we're going into time. Let, let's just be honest. Yeah. What you and I do with debates and things like that, how much longer are we going to have this freedom? Yeah. I don't know. If, if God restrains the madness of men, if God brings a revival, if God, there's so many things that God could do, and I hope and pray he does, because Marlon, I don't want my grandchildren going through what could be heading our direction. I really don't. Right, right, right. I take things like very, very uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know how much longer we're going to have to do these things. And so while we have the opportunity, it's my desire to uh, build a foundation to invest in my grandchildren, my great grandchildren and other people's grandchildren and great grandchildren. I, yeah. I met a young lady um, just yesterday at the conference I'm speaking at and this poor child has been listening to my voice her entire life. Now she's mm. probably 13, 14 years old, but wow. yeah, I've been doing this for a while. And I always apologize to such young, young folks. <laughs> Sorry. I up um, but, but, but that's what we're doing. We are, we are building a foundation. We're investing in these uh, upcoming generations because what they're going to be facing, you and I have had it easy. We really have. Yeah. Um, so you need to know who God is right. and the doctrine of the Trinity is not just some, de some debate topic for me. It is how God has revealed himself. And if I'm going to accept his wisdom, then I'm going to need to know why he has revealed himself in the way that he has. Mm -hmm. And so I take these things really, really seriously. And so I hope the conversation will be helpful to folks because people, well, I'll, I'll give you an, an example of just how, naive. I, when I was about, I would say 18, 19 years of age, uh, I remember a Bible study I was in at a very, very large Southern Baptist church. I mean, we had 20,000 members. We could only find 7,000 any given Sunday, but we had 20,000 members. And I was in the TV ministry. I helped run camera, do stuff like that. And we had a Bible study and somebody asked, well, what, what passages in the Bible teach the Trinity? And we were literally sitting there looking in the concordance of our Bible. Remember, this is pre-internet. Um, this is pre-Google. Um, what you had in, was the 28th book of the New Testament called Concordance uh, hmm. in your Bible. And we were, we were a little confused why when you turn to the T, you didn't find the entry for Trinity. Uh, why, why, why are passages right. of Trinity listed in our concordance? We honestly did not know. It's not that it was a bad church. It's just that in general, you don't get a lot of preaching and teaching mm. on issues like Trinity or the canon um, or uh, more important elements of eschatology, such as is there such a thing as eternal punishment and things like that. Um you get, you get topics that make people feel good and uh, make sure that they're giving their tithe and things like that. So I, I didn't know, and a lot of people don't know today, why it is they believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Why should it be so important? Why do we uh, refuse fellowship 
um, with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. Well, of course, they wouldn't want to have fellowship with us. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, what, why, why all these things? And so um, with that, with all that said, um, let me let me talk a little bit. Um, I, I mentioned I am a biblical Trinitarian. I, I, for example, the Council of Nicaea, since that's our cutoff point, sort of, um, the Council of Nicaea, its creed, and I've always believed this. Again, this is now controversial. I suppose it was controversial back then, but not amongst the people who knew me anyways. Um, but the Nicene Creed has authority in the, only insofar as it represents biblical truth. Now, there's, a, there's, there's people who say, no, 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 can't do that. It has authority in and of itself. They might have some kind of doctrine of development. Uh, obviously, Rome has a view where they deny sola scriptura and see this as an expression of ecclesiastical authority. But for non-Roman Catholics, okay, Eastern Orthodox, likewise, have a concept, a denial of sola scriptura, and an acceptance of um, the concept of tradition. And there are what I would call high church Protestants uh, who want to try to make room for this kind of ecclesiastical tradition, uh, development of doctrine and theology. Now, there's no question that doctrine and theology develops in its expression, and it has to. Um, we don't, most of us aren't running around speaking Koine Greek anymore or Latin, uh, which became the language of the Western church after, you know, into the third century or so. Um, we, we have to find ways of answering questions that are being asked of the biblical revelation. Yeah. So I'm not saying that, for example, I believe in the hypostatic union. It's not a biblical phrase. Neither is um, homoousius or heterousius or homoousius, terms that were thrown around at the, at the Council of Nicaea. So am I being consistent? Am I, am I contradicting myself mm. to believe in the hypostatic union, um, which, of course, is the idea that uh, in Christ you have one person with two natures, the hypostases, the the hypostatic union is not an intermixture. That would be the error of Eutychianism. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not a replacement where part of the human is, re Jesus isn't truly human, and that part that's taken out is replaced by the divine. That's Apollinarianism. It's not a splitting where uh, you have Nestorianism, which could, it didn't for Nestorius, but could lead to a, concept of adoptionism or the idea that Jesus becomes God at a later point in time. This is relevant to the term Theotokos, mother of God, God bearer, all sorts of neat, fun stuff in early church history. There really is. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe in the hypostatic union. Why? Because scripture describes Jesus as one person with two natures. Uh, it, it, and, and because we know who Jesus is, we don't necessarily catch those places where he's described in that way. But the one that's always um, really impacted me uh, is the description that Paul gives of the rulers of this age. If they had known, they would not have done crucified the Lord of glory. How do you crucify the Lord of glory? Lord of glory is clearly a divine description, a description of a divine being. You can't crucify the Lord of glory unless the word became flesh and you have the incarnation. Uh, and so Jesus is, is crucified in that human nature. Um, he gives that perfect human life as the God man. And so you, you, you believe in the hypostatic union and as, as creeds such as Nicaea or later much more complicated and more complicated as to its history, the Chalcedonian definition in 451, um, these have authority for me 
insofar as they represent and communicate biblical truth. If you say they have authority because they are ecclesiastical statements, then I have all sorts of questions for you regarding the canons and decrees that came along with these. Um, I don't see how any non-Catholic or non-Orthodox individual could accept, for example, the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea. And 99.999% of Protestants have no idea what the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea is anyways. And the vast majority of humanity has lived and died without knowing what the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea is. <laughs> so most people, you know, I, I remember in, in seminary, it was sort of default to say that you accepted the first, six, uh, first seven ecumenical councils. Now, looking back, looking at what's called the Seventh Ecumenical Council now, I go, really, seriously, you, you, you think you believe that? Um, but it was just sort of said. It was just sort of, yeah, we gave authority to these things, but we never really thought through why. And mm -hmm. we never really read what most of them said to have any idea about these things. So all this comes back to why we believe what we believe and how it's been communicated to us. I believe the doctrine of the Trinity is a divine revelation. It comes from God. Um, that gives its, its highest authority. Most people, I think, well, you know, I, I, I was going to say outside of Roman Catholicism, um, but I think, I'll be honest with you, uh, I think most of the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church today is um, significantly less committed to the divine nature of, of the Christian faith than mm -hmm. Roman Catholics were only 100 years ago. When, when I look at what uh, liberation theology is all about, and Francis is a liberation theologian, um, and how deeply Tucho Fernandez, the head of the Inquisition, has been influenced by these things, uh, I think I have a much higher view of divine revelation and the nature of the Christian faith than they do. Uh, mm -hmm. Progressivism can't give you... Th there's no reason to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity if you do not believe that God has revealed himself to exist in that way. Right. And the, the Roman church, uh, you know, back when I first started debating Roman Catholics in 1990, um, they would repeatedly say, you can't get the doctrine of the Trinity. You can't get the doctrine of the Holy spirit from scripture. They don't say that as much anymore. But the idea was scripture isn't enough to give you these doctrines. You need us to tell you these things. And the irony is with someone like Francis, you know, in his first year of his pontificate, when somebody asked him on a plane about homosexuality, he said, who am I to judge? <laughs> We're all sitting there going, we thought that was your job. <laughs> you know, You've that for a long time. I guess things are, are changed in the Vatican. And so when things change there, then things change as to the foundation of such doctrines as the Trinity. And I believe that the reason to believe in the Trinity, to die for the Trinity, to mm. <coughs> refuse to compromise, is because God in his word has revealed that this is how he exists. Mm. And that's why I'm taking the time to debate Dale Tuggy in a couple of weeks. Um, is Jesus Yahweh? Is he, is he revealed to be Yahweh? And, and um, uh, we'll be doing all that kind of stuff. So I'm a biblical Trinitarian. So what happened between the time of the apostles and the Council of Nicaea? Well, let's talk about a few things. One of the things that I think um, probably most of your audience regularly sitting there with electricity and a beautiful screen and high-speed internet and everything else. And I, I encounter this all the time, even from people my age. We realize how completely different communication was mm. in that time period. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, Justin Martyr dies in the middle of the second century. He is a he never took off the the pallium, the, the sign of the Greek philosopher. He is deeply influenced by Greek philosophy. And yet, uh, I would point to him as a person who believed that Jesus was Yahweh. He makes that argument in his writings. 
we don't have uh, everything that he wrote. Um, most of the time when we're dealing with early writers, especially in the primitive period of the first couple of centuries, <clears throat> we are dealing with um, fragmentary records very frequently. Um, for example, I, I, I read a quote from Melito Sardis on the dividing line yesterday, and it comes to us from Eusebius. Well, Eusebius wrote in the, in the fourth century. So that, that original book's gone. We can't, we, we can't look it up any longer. We have to trust Eusebius. <coughs> I'm going to probably back my volume off a little bit. All right. No problem. <laughs> talking for six and a half hours now and uh it's it's and i've and i've had congestion now for about uh nine weeks so I'm, I'm getting sick of the whole thing um anyway um but uh we very often we only have fragmentary records of what someone said very often it's it's secondhand information uh, it's not like what we have today we don't have mp3 recordings no one's sitting there with an iphone to record this stuff and so even when books are written, um, let, let me get you involved here. Let, let, let's see. Okay. Let's see how well you've listened to the hundreds of debates that you have you have hosted. If anyone ever brought this up, um, what book of the New Testament, Marlon, do you think we have the fewest manuscripts of? The fewest manuscripts? Um... Yeah. Thinking the fewest manuscripts. Well, don't, don't, don't people ask you questions during the debates? <laughs> no, they don't ask. They don't ask me questions during the debate. And what's interesting is that I did, I did a uh, lesson on the transmission of the biblical text to my church as well. And so uh, this subject matter was definitely a part of it. But it's escaping me right now which one um, of the New Testament has the, the least. Oh, of course. What was that? When I tell you, you'll go, oh, of course. What was it Philemon? It's the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, got you, got you. Now, a lot of people in the audience are probably going, why is that an of course? Because there was great question about the canonical status of the book of Revelation. And that's not a bad thing. I'm okay. If you're a big fan of certain eschatological systems, it might be, but <clears throat> it's not a bad thing that the church exercised discernment. And when you're looking at a book that has all sorts of 10 headed monsters and apocalyptic language, and it's, it's appropriate to go, are we sure that this was the apostle John? Are we sure that this was associated with somebody who knew Christ? Um, are, are we certain about these things? And so it's not surprising that the book of revelation has the smallest number of surviving manuscripts to our day because mm. it struggled for inclusion in the canon and yeah, that's an that's appropriate right, thing. Right. yeah um and so uh when we look to go back to justin martyr justin martyr had almost no influence in his theology from paul what would our theology look like without paul right 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 um so when you think about it, those first letters, the, the first, the books in the New Testament were all written as individual books mm -hmm. and were sent all over the place. So Paul's epistles go to this church, that church. When, when Paul says in Colossians 4.16, read the epistle that's coming from Laodicea. I, I love asking people, how many of you did your, your morning devotions out of the epistle to Laodiceans? Because I can sometimes catch people going, me? <laughs> there isn't one. But actually, I think there is. Um, I think that's Ephesians. Now, why mm. do I think that's Ephesians? Because think about it. Ephesus is the main church in the Lycus River Valley. Paul spent three years there. Mm. But if you never notice something about Ephesians, there are no personal greetings. Oh, There's yeah. personal greetings on the in the, the church that he knew the best that he had lived with. He calls mm. the Ephesian elders to him when he's on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20. But there's nothing personal in it. 
And there are actually a few sources early on that don't even have in Ephesus at the beginning of the epistle. So I think that was meant to be a circular epistle that was to be co copied and, and, and sent around the Lycus River Valley churches. And that would have been coming from Laodicea. So I think Colossians 4.16 mm -hmm. is referring to what we have as the book of, of, of Ephesians. The point is these were all written as separate letters and sent different places at different times. And so how, how do you get all that put together without mm. a fax machine, gotcha. without a postal? Service? How does that even happen? It's a complicated thing. And so in the second century, you have a number of people who are functioning with a limited canon. They may not even have all of the New Testament. And I just ask anybody, how, how, what kind of an impact would that have on your theology yeah, to have yeah. much less than what we have today? Now, look, well, I don't know that I would necessarily be overly impacted by not having second and third John and Philemon. Okay, I think they're inspired yeah. scripture. They're important. I think there's some really neat things in it. But yeah, I get it. You probably would still come up with pretty much the same theological system, uh, even yeah. if you didn't have those. But what if you didn't have Romans or Colossians? Yeah, um, big time. You, Galatians? Wow, okay. Um, so it's important to, to keep in mind that if you have a beautiful leather-bound Bible, I'm, I'm here in, in Nashville, and the, uh, the pastor that's putting on this conference I'm speaking at is Jeffrey Rice. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen post tenebrous yeah. Lux oh, yeah. Bible read. Oh, yeah. But that's that nice. Right. Yeah, they're beautiful, oh, beautiful Bibles. Nice. Gorgeous. I, I didn't bring mine up here, unfortunately. I could go grab it if you yeah. want to see it, but I'm... Yeah, uh, I've been telling... Uh, today, uh, yeah, I've been uh, telling Jeffrey Rice to, uh, to... to I told him to... He should make a, a TikTok. I know you're not big on that, but a TikTok with with him binding the Bibles and sort of, you know, explaining the gospel as he's doing it, you know, cause I think that I, I, I appreciate, I had Jeffrey Rice actually on the show, um, with, uh, with, with Braden Pater, Patterson, Braden was on there, Jeffrey was on here and they were debating a couple non Calvinists concerning the, the, the doctrines of grace. And, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I, I told him he hasn't responded, but I told him <laughs> that I'm going to say, I got a Bible at, I got a Bible that needs to be rounded, you know, and I want him to do it, you know, uh, cause his Bibles are absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, they are. They are. And, um, so it, this is his conference and, um, I was preaching from my, I don't know if you've seen the Johnny Cash Bible, but it's all in black. The page edges are black. The leather is black. The ribbons are black. Uh, it's a giant print uh, legacy standard Bible, and it's it's gorgeous. It's wonderful. Um, nice. But anyway, if you have that, you need to realize that you have a blessing and a privilege that 98% of Christians have. I mean, uh, even at the time of the Council of Nicaea, we have two manuscripts from around that time period called Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And they would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars in our modern money to have had produced at that time. And almost no Christians would have had the, the, the money to do that. Only a church could mm. maybe come up with that kind of money for a single copy. And then it's only going to be a church. It's not, not something you're carrying around. The thing's huge if you've ever seen uh, either one of them. If you've seen Codex Sadianicus, the uh, Hendrickson Bible Publishers does a facsimile, and it must weigh 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that we can have all of the scriptures available to us, and today, man, sitting on my on my iPhone, yeah, I have multiple Bible programs with multiple translations and multiple Greek texts and Hebrew texts. There's never been a time in history. Yeah. when we've had the amount of information available to us that we have today. Mm. And people don't realize that. They, they, they anachronistically project back to that early time period that everybody back then had the same material that we have today. And that's just simply not true. Even copies of the Old Testament in Greek or Hebrew would have primarily been in churches and things like that uh, an individual Christian wouldn't have them. 
And that's why, for example, when uh, Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate um, at the, in the late 300s, early 400s, beginning of the 5th century, and he more accurately translated the, the, the story of Jonah, uh, Jerome learned Hebrew. And so when he translated Jonah, he accurately represented the, the gourd uh, that grew up over Jonah's head. And he used a different description than had been found in the Greek Septuagint, which was really the church, the Bible of the early church, the, the Old Testament text. And when his Latin translation was first read uh, in Carthage, it resulted in a riot. And the reason was most people only knew scripture as they heard it read in that fashion. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to own their own copies. And so people don't realize that. They don't think about that and how, ble A, how blessed we are, but B, how that would impact um, not only how my theology would develop, but also how quickly uh, theological concepts could be uh, communicated from one place to another. So first thing to remember, things were different back then. Communication's much slower. The second thing to remember is persecution. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with Nero in AD 64, up until the peace of the church, the peace of the church is in AD 313. I, I think these are numbers that people might want to write down and maybe even yeah. memorize because they're important. The persecution ends across the empire in 313 with the Edict of Toleration. And what's fascinating is the period of greatest persecution of the Christian church took place between 303 and 313. So there was 10 years during which, now there had been persecution before then, mm -hmm. obviously, from Nero onward, but it was primarily localized. It was not empire wide. Mm -hmm. Now you had Decius, you had the Decian persecution and, and things like that, but there were always periods where there at places where the persecution didn't necessarily reach. Now the church was always in danger because it could, it could arise at any moment. But the only time that the Roman empire sought to destroy Christianity root and branch top to bottom was between 303 and 313. Okay. And that's where everybody, not just leaders or bishops or clerics or things like that, but any Christian, um, any Christian writing, everything was to be destroyed. So for 10 years, uh, Rome tried its best and failed. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting to realize 313 is only 12 years before what? Council of Nicaea. Mm. So the Council of Nicaea takes place, and, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it 10,000 times on, on your channel. People love to say that the Council of Nicaea determined the canon of Scripture. Right, and, right. <laughs> um, right. Uh, this is this is where Constantine took over the church and you know all the rest of this kind of stuff and everything's blamed on the Council of Nicaea. Um, the the funny thing, well, it, it would be funny if it wasn't serious. The funny thing is when people say that the deity of Christ was invented mm. at the Council of Nicaea. I had a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses tell me that over the years, um, and I've been very happy to disabuse them of their error. And that's normally when they left the house, but. <laughs> anyway, uh, when you think about it, it's it's always just struck me as so strange that someone would believe that the the church council meeting in 325, 318 bishops by tradition, we don't know that number, but that's the, the, the number that's been passed down by tradition. 318 bishops meet at Nicaea. That's only 12 years after the end of the worst persecution in the history of the church. Are you mm -hmm. seriously telling me there are men there mm -hmm. who still have scars from the beatings they took before the persecution ended? There are people there who were imprisoned. There are people there who knew people who died. There, 
are you telling me that those people who had stood up to Rome for all those years, only 12 years later, when the emperor comes along, he says, oh, I want you to believe that Jesus is homoousius with the father. And they had never heard of this before. They had never thought of this before, but they're like, well, it's the Roman emperor, so we must we must believe it. Seriously, the same people who have been persecuted only 12 years earlier are now just going to roll over and say, whatever you say, it's absurd. Mm. Right, right, it's right. Absolutely. Um, and yet I see it all the time. And I'll I'll go ahead and blame um, both of the uh, formats that we're on right now, YouTube and Twitter, because there's there's no filter on these things. And there, there can't be. But there's no filter on these things to stop the foolishness of people posting videos making the most absurd uh, statements about about Nicaea. So what's fascinating is you you have persecution, like I said, from 64 to 313. It waxes and wanes. There are lots of Christians who are martyred. If you're if you've never read Cyprian's letter to the Christians in the mines, M-I-N-E-S, the mines, you know, digging gold and silver out of the ground. Do you know what I'm referring to? Are you familiar with it? I'm not. I, I definitely have to check that one out. I'm not familiar with it. Write that, write, believe me, Marlon, you write that down and you look it up. It's online, easy to find on Google. You read it. It'll take 20 minutes. You will thank okay. me. You will thank me. Everyone will thank me for reading the epistle that Cyprian wrote to the Christians in the mines. This would be around 252-ish, around that time period in North Africa. Okay. Um, Christians were, were being imprisoned, made to, to, to dig gold and silver for the, for the Romans. Most of them died in that imprisonment. And yet Cyprian's epistle to them, will probably cause you to cry mm. and to cry out to God for forgiveness for how often we complain about things when our forefathers endured so much more than we could ever imagine for the sake of the cross. Wow. Um, it's, it, it's truly fantastic. And so this is taking place. To, and, and Cyprian Cyprian's only a believer for, I think, I have to look it up, but I think about 11 years. And mm. he dies as a martyr. He was decapitated by a Roman soldier. Mm. Um, he sealed his, his testimony with his blood. And so you, you, you know that you know, that's 50, that's 60 years um, prior to the end of the persecutions. There was still a lot of persecution. I mean, think about the, the, yeah. the, uh, Soviet Union is about 70 years. Mm -hmm. So this is a long period of time. We're talking centuries that the church persecuted in wow, wow. this kind of, uh, of, of trial and difficulty. And yet, despite those external persecutions, tremendous amount of energy is dedicated to discussion of theological issues. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the 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 issue that causes the greatest division in the early church is how to respond to persecution yeah 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 what do you what do you do when someone apostatizes under persecution under torture and then and then the persecution ends in your area and they want to come back to the church but up in the church didn't give in and maybe Husband or wife was killed. Maybe they now have scars from the, the torture that they received. What do you do with the person who wants back into the fellowship of the church when you've got people who didn't give in? Yeah, yeah. And that issue caused the first great schisms in the church. Uh, the Novation schism, the Donatist schism, uh, the Donatist, Donatist controversy in North Africa primarily. Um, and the church had to struggle with these things. But with the persecution going on outside, they then had those issues of persecution. They were dealing with the Christological issues 
um, even in the, in the second century in the East, patripassionism, modalism, what we would call today oneness. You've got a debate mm -hmm. coming up on that. Yes, sir. Um, that was being dealt with in the Eastern church, not so much the Western church. Mm. Um, so they're dealing with theological issues while dodging Roman soldiers. And there's other controversies. They have the con what's called the Corda Deciman controversy, where that's the controversy over what day to celebrate Easter. The West did it one way, the East did it another way. Mm -hmm. That That's one of the many things that eventually would pile up until the Great Schism in 1054. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's, we, th we think we have it tough today, but think what it was like for someone living in Cyprian's age, in the middle of the third century. You've got persecution from the Roman Empire. You've got heresies, you've got controversies, and then you've got Gnosticism. Ooh, okay. And I know uh, Gnosticism, <laughs> Gnosticism, everyone likes to call other people Gnostics. And normally everybody who calls other people Gnostics has never read any Gnostic works themselves, have no idea what it's actually all about. Um, <laughs> The, the original forms of Gnosticism coming out of the East, I, I think we, we see evidence of the New Testament warning about them in 1 John and Colossians especially. But then you have, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I really can't go into a lot of detail right now. It would take us uh, a lot of time to do it. But um, mm -hmm. I, I think it is helpful and I've done this on my program. I've done story time with Uncle Jimmy, where I will read some of these Gnostic books, like the Gospel of Thomas, so that people can really hear what is being said mm -hmm. and go, oh, that's really weird. Why do people claim so much for this kind of stuff? But then in the middle of the second century, you have the rise of what's called Valentinian Gnosticism. And Valentinianism is a specific, purposeful attempt to create a fake Christianity that is fundamentally different. You're taking mm -hmm. Gnostic concepts, you're removing some of the stuff that you know the Christians are just going to go, you're nuts. Because the Gnostics believe that, that Jehovah, Yahweh, was Yaldabaoth, a mm -hmm. demiurge. Demiurge. Um, and they would uh, ridicule the, the foolishness uh, that uh, there's, there's one Gnostic gospel where uh, he is mocked for saying he's the only true God with a quotation from the book of Isaiah and Valentinianism was a huge challenge to the early church, huge challenge to the early church. I mean, think how would you deal with, with a religious system that is trying to look as much like you as possible, but fundamentally undercutting the foundations of what you believe by saying Jesus is an eon and stuff like that. And you don't even necessarily have the entire New Testament yet. Right, right, right. That's not easy stuff to do. Yeah. And so people need to recognize that during this time period, there are very, very important controversies that are being hammered out mm -hmm. um and without necessarily uh, unanimity of opinion on everything either but they are they are facing these things and they are seeking to provide answers to these things and that requires the development of a vocabulary if the gnostics come along and they're asking questions based upon greek philosophy then you need to be able to answer those questions and, the, and so the question for us is, did they answer them consistently with mm -hmm. biblical revelation? Or one thing is obviously true, individual early church fathers and many of them as a whole over time um, made mistakes and started creating traditions that were not biblical. For, so it, yeah. it seems incredibly obvious to me. Mm -hmm. That, for example, 
the biblical view of men and women both made in the image of God. Um, the uh, concept of uh, what marriage is, the holiness of the marriage situation. It's very obvious that um, beginning even at the end of the second century in the 180s and really exploding into the 200s, you have the rise of what are called the Desert Fathers and the beginning of monasticism. And that leads to you to people like uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, who had a lot of seriously unbiblical ideas that influenced a lot of people. And then you start building on that tradition and building upon that tradition. And what was a small error down here becomes a big error up here. Got you, got you. And this this is happening during this this time period as well. So it's it, it's a complex period. We could wish to have so much more documentation than we have. Mm -hmm. um, so you're very often you're trying to judge somebody on fragmentary material. Uh, Origin, for example, had somebody following him around at all time, writing down everything he said. We have not even translated everything that is available from Origin into English. And I'll be honest with you, I don't wow. know that we should waste time doing it. But the point is. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff from origin. We don't even have it in English. Mm. You have a lot of stuff from people like Augustine. Okay, that's true. But then there are other people like Melito of Sardis who ended up on the wrong side of a controversy, the Court of Desmond controversy, that we only have fragments from. And man, the fragments we have are awesome. His uh, Paschal sermon, uh, I quoted it in The Forgotten Trinity where he talks about Jesus as uh, at what well, calls Jesus God, just like Ignatius does. Um, but then the whole the whole issue being um, he who hung the earth in place is hung in place. He who created the tree is fixed upon the tree. Um, I mean, the description that Melito gives of, of Christ, very clearly believing in the full deity of Christ, but distinguishing Christ from the Father. Um, and this is, again, in the second century. It's very, very early. Um, so you have all that kind of stuff that you can, you can look at and try to draw some conclusions from. Mm -hmm. But back to our subject, uh, because I see the clock is, is running and so is my voice. Um, yeah, I hear you. It's only going to last so long. Um, what then about the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, if it's a divine revelation, then it was true all during that time period. The only question is, how is it being expressed? And should we expect early writers in this time period to utilize all the same uh, language and terminology that we utilize that has been hammered out over time to to accurately express biblical truths. So for example, coming out of Alexandria, uh, Origen referred to Jesus as the os, God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Greek, but he referred to the father as ha theos with an article. So there is, uh, together with his Logos Christology, there is an implicit subordinationism in Origen. Now, does that mean that Origen would, would have agreed with Arius? No, it doesn't mean that. One of the, one of the things, one of the mistakes that people make, and I, I, try to, I try to instruct people on this when I teach church history as often as I can, you have to judge the early writers within the context in which they were writing. Mm. It is far too easy to pretend that we can take these men, remove them from the context they were in, assume they had knowledge that we may or may not know that they actually had, and demand that they answer questions that were never asked of them. Mm. That is an abuse of history. It happens all the time. It happens every day on the internet, believe you me. Yeah. Um, but we should never be doing it. Um, not if we're, we're going to be fair. Um, let the early church writers be the early church writers and recognize that many of the questions, for example, that are going to be uh, dealt with in the years 
leading up to the Council of Ephesus and then Chalcedon. Um, we're not even being asked in the days of Tertullian or Justin Martyr uh, before him. Um, Hippolytus, that, that whole time period, th th those questions are not even being asked. So it's easy to fault them for using language that we would not use today because of the controversies that have happened afterwards. And we've hammered out this terminology so that we can express biblical truths consistently. It's really easy to fault them, mm -hmm. but it's not fair to fault them. And yeah. and I won't do it. I will, but I, I I that's just that's just not how you should do it. So did do we have evidence of the early church believing the things that we believe today in regards to the Trinity? Well, one of my favorite early writers, and there's I notice that the oneness guys and some other groups really try to um, diminish the importance and the reliability of this individual's writings. But Ignatius of Antioch, Ignatius was the Bishop of Antioch at the beginning of the second century. So he dies. And again, it's not like there was a calendar on the wall that we can make reference to, but um, I date his death around 108 AD. So not long after John would have died. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very, very early, extremely early, uh, early second century. And there are two quotations. Now, let me just mention, there are only seven genuine epistles from Ignatius. Um, one thing people do need to know is that, especially in the first five, 600 years, there was a lot of forgery going on. If you wanted to sell books, you'd yep. attach someone's name to your book that was well known. And so there are pseudo Ignatian epistles uh, that were written 100 years, 200 years after Ignatius that exist out there that were not original with Ignatius. And in fact, the Watchtower Society back in whoa, about 1985 or so, uh, put out a watchtower where they tried to deal with early church history. And when they dealt with Ignatius, the only materials they quoted from were the pseudo Ignatian epistles. They didn't quote any mm. of the original ones because they Ignatius called Jesus God over and over and over again. They don't mention any of those. It was, gotcha, it was gotcha. purpose, clearly purposeful. I, I wrote an article at the time I was, I, I somewhere on that time I was, um, yeah, it was late, late, late eighties. I became scholar of residence at Grand Canyon University, and I wrote an article called "Scholastic Dishonesty in the Watchtower," mm. and uh, it may still be on domain.org. Anyway, there are seven genuine epistles from Ignatius that he writes as he's going to Rome to be martyred, and we can learn a lot from these epistles. We learn, for example, there is no single bishop in mm. Rome at this time. Hmm, it's interesting. Um, and in fact, Rome does not develop a single bishop hierarchy until about 140 AD. They okay. didn't believe for the first 80 years of their experience that they needed to have a single bishop called the Pope uh, because there wasn't one. It's made up later on. Mm. But in Ignatius's letter to the Ephesians, he gives us two, and they're fairly closely closely connected one's ephesians 7 one's ephesians 9 and both of these are just amazing to me um let me give you ephesians 7 first okay. there is one position of flesh and of spirit generate and ingenerate god in man true life in death of mary it could be first from Mary, but from Mary and from God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm. Now, this is 108. Listen to the Christology there. 
there is one phys physician of flesh and of spirit, sarkikos kai pneumatikos, genetos kai agenetos, generate and ingenerate, and anthropotheos. That's about as close as you're going to get to God man. Hmm. God in man, and anthropotheos, true life in death, both from Mary and from God. Hypostatic union. That's mm -hmm. that's Chalcedon. Mm. And yet that's 340 years before Chalcedon. Mm. Both from Mary and from God, first passable and then impassable. And there's a lot of discussion as to what Ignatius is focusing upon, incarnation, death, burial, resurrection. It depends on how you're going to interpret him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here... He doesn't then stop and you and and go, now let me explain all these things to you. He expects the church at Ephesus to understand this stuff. And hmm, which church did Paul spend so much time in? Which church yeah. in the in the Ephesus. seven churches in the book of Revelation is clearly commended for its maturity and its groundedness and its knowledge? Ephesus. Ephesus. Yep. So he's writing to them. And he can describe Jesus at the level of the Council of Chalcedon. He doesn't use the term hypostatic union, but he's describing it. It's there. It's, it's there. Certainly there. Yeah. Certainly there. And that's in 108 AD. Wow. Now, that was a fairly well-known citation. Just a few sentences later, though, is one that's a little less well-known. Check this one out. You are stones of a temple, which were beforehand prepared for a building of God the Father, being raised to the heights through the engine of Jesus Christ, which is the cross, and using as a rope the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now, uh, you, are, you are stones of a temple, which were beforehand prepared for a building of God the Father, So Theu Patras, God the Father, being raised unto the heights, diates mechanes, mechanes, mechanism, engine, uh, uh, something able to do work. And it's through the engine of Jesus Christ, mm. which is the staros, the cross. The cross is being seen as a, you know, the Romans would have those catapults and, and, mm -hmm. uh, I've been to, I did get, I got one chance to go to Israel in 2018 and we went to Masada. Uh, do you know what it is? I do not No. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of things to look up here. Um, all right, all but right. <laughs> there was a 1980s TV miniseries called Masada. Had some big names in it. It was very, very well done. And believe me, there's not much worth watching on TV these days. That's worth watching because it's a true story. Of 900 Jewish rebels surrounded by a Roman legion in Herod's palace up on top of this impenetrable force, fortress on this the edge of the uh, Dead Sea. And in 2018, I got to go there and climb what's called the Snake Path up to mm. the top of of Masada, uh, it oh, it's just absolutely fascinating. It it truly is well worth watching the video and and reading the story of of what took place. And the Romans built a siege ramp all the way up that thing. It's still there to this wow. day. Wow! And the mechanisms that they would use to raise this stuff—that's what's being pictured here. Mm. Uh, by Ignatius, and he's saying that the building of God the Father, the the mechanism that's pulling these stones up and building this temple to God the Father is Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is mm -hmm. the one that's... That's how you make these stones. Wow. And how do you get them up there? Using as a rope the Holy Spirit. Wow. Now, wow. again, we are used to um 
hearing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, at Apologia, we do the, the benediction uh, each Sunday night after the service. And frequently, if, if Jeff preaches, I'll do the benediction. If I preach, he does the benediction. Um, but I'll do something like, you know, we put our, our hands up and I'll go um, something along the lines of, uh, may the may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, "Amen." And so we have the benediction at the at the end of the end of the service. And so we're used to hearing this language, but we need to recognize when you hear it this far back in non biblical material. Here is someone who is putting together in the closest relationship god the father jesus christ and the holy spirit now i've often tried to explain to people and there i i know there are some people disagree with me on this but i i stand with someone like bb warfield uh who i learned so much from on the doctrine of the trinity back when i was in college and seminary um when when people ask me where is the Trinity revealed in Scripture? And again, I forgot to bring my Bible in here. Um, but um, I open it up to Matthew chapter 1. And I show them the gutter in the, between the, the, the last verses of Malachi and the first verses of Matthew. And I go, there is where the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed. And they look at me and go, you're weird. I go, well, think about it for just a moment. Mm -hmm. The greatest evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity is the incarnation, ministry, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Where did that happen? Chronologically, it happened after the last verse of Malachi and before the first verse of Matthew was ever written, it happened in history. Hmm. All the New Testament was, all the Old Testament was written before it. All the New Testament was written in light of it. Hmm. And I say to you, you cannot make sense of what the New Testament says about what God has done in Christ, in the gospel, in anything else outside of the doctrine of the Trinity. So what you read in the New Testament is not someone trying to prove the Trinity. You're reading Trinitarians, writing mm. to other Trinitarians and using Trinitarian language, mm. which is a Paul can switch back and forth from the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God without stopping going, oh, let me explain that. This, that's this new Trinity thing. No, he never does that because the revelation has taken place in history and the New Testament then becomes a testimony to that revelation in history. And so Paul can go to 1 Corinthians 8. He can take the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Akkad, and he can expand it out into 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6 for Christians because we're Trinitarians. Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. He heard God the Father speak in the Mount of Transfiguration. He walked with God the Son, who is found dwelt by God the Spirit. And so these are Trinitarians writing to other Trinitarians. That's why I can use as an example, as a sermon illustration, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ is to God. And he doesn't have to stop and explain it because yeah, they already, already, already aware it. of it. Yeah, yeah. They're already aware of it. So... That's how the, the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed. And so it shouldn't surprise us then that Ignatius, even though he may not have had all of that New Testament, he was certainly early enough to know the apostles. When Ignatius writes to the Ephesians, he can utilize this type of language of this building being built to God the Father using the machinery of Jesus, which is the cross, and the rope is the Holy Spirit, there's an, and and no one's going. Isn't that a little blasphemous? Because think about it. Let let let's let's say Ignatius was a Jehovah's Witness. That would be building a building, a temple for Jehovah, using as the mechanism the torture stake of Michael the Archangel, and using as a rope an impersonal act of force. 
<laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Right. Not really. <laughs> so, so when you see language like this, it is extremely significant and shouldn't just be, you know, looked over. It's 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 right there. So that's 108. Um, when you get to the middle of that century with Justin Martyr, as I said, even though, even though he does not have a complete canon, Mm-hmm. He argues specifically against Trifo the Jew that Jesus is Yahweh. Wow. 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 You're not going to make that kind of argumentation mm-hmm. if you don't already have the, the concept of yeah. the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't have to be using that terminology. That terminology does come toward the end of that century, uh, triad, Trinitas, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not the use that makes it true. The use is meant to describe what we have in the pages of Scripture and in the divine revelation that's been given to us and recorded for us in the New Testament. And so will you find people who use language uh, prior to the Council of Nicaea that is not as um, airtight as what we would use today? Yes, of course. What would you expect? Mm -hmm. They weren't dealing with the questions that have been dealt with hundreds of years after they died. So to condemn them on the basis of that, I think is silly. The other thing to keep in mind uh, is that around the same time as Justin Martyr and 10, 15, 20 years after that, um, the East is dealing with a theological controversy that the West isn't really dealing with. Patripassionism, modalism, what we call oneness teaching. And again, the teaching of the United Pentecostal Church International Day about who Jesus is, is a bit different than the modalists of the ancient world. Um, Cause there were lots of, there was lots of variations amongst them and they had different understandings of the sun and things like that. But the denial of the existence of three divine persons was an issue primarily in the East uh, in the middle to second century. So why is that important? Well, it seems uh, there's things. In the early church, Greek is the universal language. Then, beginning with Tertullian, Latin begins to take over as the primary language in the West. Um. And so now you have uh, the Latin West trying to communicate with the Greek East and you have issues of translation. Are we using these terms in the same way? Are we using them in a different way? That led to a lot of the problems in the third, fourth, even into the fifth century. But it seems fairly clear that one of the terms that had come up in the debates in the East and had been rejected by the church was homoousius. Mm. And it was the modalists who were using it. Wow. So the, er, the, the Eastern church said, no, that sounds like modalism. We reject that. We believe that the sun has eternally existed as the sun. And so when Nicaea uses this, this is why Eusebius has to write this big long letter back to his church because he knows if he's he goes back having signed the Nicene Creed that uses Homo Usius, oh, he's saying that the substance as the Father, that they're going to lynch him. Mm. I mean, they're, they're going to they're going to beat him up yeah. because they've already rejected that terminology, but they rejected it in a different context. Got gotcha. you. They rejected it as it was being used to promote oneness, what we would call oneness or modalistic or patripassionist con- uh, type of, uh, of belief, not in the context Nicaea was using it in. Mm. So it wasn't that Nicaea just said, well, we're going to use what the patripassionists has said. No, they were trying to find a, a term that Arius, who was a really sharp dude, I, I my understanding is he was really good looking and he could sing well. That's how you start a cult these days. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how Copeland got away with it, but anyway, that's another issue. Um, uh, so uh, 
that was one of the main problems of the acceptance of the terminology of the Nicene symbol was the East had already said, no, we, we're not going to use that. And so there had to be a process of explaining it in its current context to get over those objections that, that already existed. So we, we've already talked about so many things mm -hmm. that clearly demonstrate that there was complexity um, yeah. involved in how to answer questions and how to use certain uh, language. And, and, and one other thing, I, I know we're about out of time, but one other thing, and we never, we didn't get to a single question. I, I apologize, but one yeah. other, I tend to talk a lot on interviews. I apologize about that. It, it makes it a whole lot easier for you. When you turn the camera off, you could have caught some Z's. There's all sorts of stuff. You've done. <laughs> Nobody... um, once I start talking, I just don't stop talking. That's, that's, I that's the I... problem. Um, but, um, oh, drat. I went off on, on that. There was one other issue I was going to raise and it has flat flown right out of my mind. I apologize. It'll probably come back to me as soon as we get done, but no, unless fine. you want to throw some questions, if yeah, you want to throw some can... questions in, go ahead and do that. And I'll, I'll remember what it was I was going to talk about when we do that. All right. No problem. Yeah. We have a couple super chats here. I don't know if you're familiar with Super Chats, man. You familiar with Super Chats, Dr. James White? <laughs> I I am. Uh, we've never used them. We don't do it this kind. This this is not not how we've done it. Now I do want yeah. to point out, we were the first podcasters before there were pods. Um, <laughs> the divine started being distributed by Real Audio in about 2001. So we've been at this for a long, long time. But no, we don't have any Super Chats. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> All right, this is coming from Steve Christie. I'm not sure if you know Steve Christie, or if you're familiar with him. He does a lot of work uh, in the area of Roman Catholicism um, and dealing with Marian doctrines and things like that. But his question is, thank you for the support, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, so Isaiah 41, 48, 12 says, me uh, slash I am is the first and the last, which is distinct from Lord God and his spirit in verse 16. Plus Lord is savior, Isaiah 63, 8 distinct from um i'm not sure what he's his i think he's i do oh verse 10 i, know, doesn't, I know where he's going okay doesn't the old testament support the trinity um yes it, it, it does but i i think we need to recognize that it does so um prophetically um it, it does so pointing to certain aspects I, I do know that there are some fine brothers who like believe the jews were trinitarians i i can't defend that i i i don't know how you would defend that but there are, are those who would take that position um in light of what takes place in history we can look at isaiah 9 6 isaiah 7 14 um, the I sayings, the, look, the I am sayings in Isaiah are clearly what Jesus is drawing from in John 8, 24, 8, 58, 13, 19, 18, 5 through 6. Very clearly. There's, there's no question about that. So it's not that the Old Testament uh, contradicts the Trinity. The Old Testament has these indicators that in light of what happens in history, and what's revealed in New Testament scripture, we can then see these things. Um, but I'm very hesitant when people go beyond that to say, and that means that the Jews were themselves Trinitarians, because uh, until the incarnation, I just don't think you'd have the sufficient clarity to be able to recognize what those passages were referring to. All right, all right. Uh, a couple more questions, Dr. James White, then I'm going to let you go. I know you need to get some rest, man. I don't want to hold you too long. Um, let me... He's like running real slow. Don't know why, but... All right, so this question is coming uh, actually from a Unitarian, um, and he is uh, debating on the last three before. This is Andrew Griffin. Uh, question, you, you mentioned the need for future generations to have God's wisdom. Is this the same wisdom as Proverbs 8? And do you believe wisdom there is a person? So this is 
part of the Unitarian argumentation against the deity of Christ to try to say that since God's wisdom allegedly is created and Jesus is identified as God's wisdom, that Jesus must be created. Um, again, this Jehovah's Witnesses have been using that one for a very, very long period of time. Obviously, I wasn't even addressing that topic. Um, we're talking about God's wisdom as in the Holy Spirit of God helping. I was talking about my grandchildren, great-grandchildren to understand the foundations of God's revelation and God's truth. Uh, but in response to this particular question, the biblical answer as to whether creation, I'm sorry, wisdom is created and therefore a, a creature uh, lesser than Yahweh uh, is pretty clearly answered two ways. A, God cannot be unwise and therefore wisdom is eternal with Yahweh. And secondly, the clear teaching of the New Testament is to the eternality of the Son. Uh, they can try to mess with Colossians chapter one, but Colossians chapter one clearly teaches that Jesus is the creator of all things, that he's eternal. Um, he's identified as Yahweh, as we will demonstrate in two, two weeks from tonight. No. Yeah, I think it's two weeks from tonight. Anyways, it's, I think, the 9th of March uh, in uh, Houston when I debate Dale Tuggy on is Jesus identified as Yahweh? Uh, so we will we will lay all that information out uh, in the debate, and everybody will be able to watch online. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. A couple more, and then you're you're done, Doctor Way. I know I <laughs> I'm holding you in here a little bit. Um, and here is a question, another super chat. Thank you, Red Pill Christian, for the super chat. I'm a Trinitarian. Can you give me a good response to the oneness on being? The ones on being baptized in Jesus name versus the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes, you should buy a book called The Forgotten Trinity by James White. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, read, read the discussion uh, therein from 1998. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the one this error here is the assumption that in the book of Acts, when it says they're baptized in Jesus name, that this was the actual baptismal formula. The baptismal formula is given to us by Jesus in Matthew 28, which is why some oneness people try to deny the originality of Matthew 28, 19 through 20, even though from a textual critical perspective, that's impossible. In Acts, all they're saying is this was Christian baptism. They were baptized in Jesus' name. That is, they, they are identifying with the Christian movement and taking Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's not the baptismal formula that's given in Acts that's in Matthew. Uh, the Acts passages are simply telling us that this was Christian baptism uh, over against. There were lots of other baptisms um, uh, out there, but they received Christian baptism. So the oneness folks try to get rid of Matthew 28 and shrink things down to being baptized only in Jesus name. They've got it backwards. They they need to recognize what they're focusing on was a general statement of Christian baptism, the specific baptismal formula is found in Matthew 28. All right, and this will be the last question, Dr. White here, um, another super chat coming from Lego, my ego, I me. I don't know if that's a reference to <laughs> letting go of I am to I am, um, but Lego, ego, my I me says, hey doc, I'm wondering what you have to say about the fact that the, that the early church fathers seem to be more anti-Nicene rather than modern day Trinitarians. Should we look at Tertullian as being an error? Yeah, I'm not sure what they mean. Seem to be more anti-Nicene. Um, Anti-Nicene means before Nicaea, not anti as in against Nicaea. Mm. So um, they, they, anyone before Nicaea is anti-Nicene, A-N-T-E. So that, that's not a proper description. Um, was Tertullian in error? Again, as I, as I said a couple of times, Tertullian wasn't even asking the questions and dealing with the questions that would be dealt with at Nicaea and after Nicaea. So was he an error in, in the sense that we can say things more clearly than he did? Okay, yeah. But those weren't the questions that were being asked at that particular point in time. Was he an error about other things? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's fascinating listening to his discussion of baptism, for example, um, delaying baptism, uh, having baptism for, for, for young people who are in danger of dying. There was all sorts of different views of baptism at that time. And he got so tired of the formal church in his day, he became a Montanist the last few years of his life. 
uh, mm -hmm. because they had a stronger emphasis upon holiness. He was a part of the less wild, crazy version of Montanism. But uh, so he he had his issues just like everybody else did. What I've been trying to say is read the early church fathers in the context in which they they live and the questions they actually deal dealt with. And if the questions that we're talking about today, they never even heard, don't try to drag them into something. It's just unfair. It's it's a it's not fair to represent them in that way. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dr. James White, I appreciate you so much. And it was just awesome to just get hear you give a straight up history lesson. Because that's what we got. So I uh, thank you so much, Dr. White. We really appreciate you invited the professor of church history from grace bible theological seminary on and you're surprised <laughs> <laughs> no i definitely pleasantly I, I it was a pleasant time dr white man i really appreciate you man and i think obviously through all the emails i've sent you over the years i think it's like two years i've been emailing you to get your own but all the emails you know that i really uh desire for you to come on and give us a rundown um and this particular subject matter i think is very important and so i I'm just thankful for all the work you've done, everything you're doing for us. And I pray that God will continue to give you strength to continue to press forward and do your thing, man, because uh, you're a blessing to the church, Dr. White. I just want to let you know that, man. Well, I appreciate that. And the prayers would be appreciated. Like I said, this is a long trip and um, I can't seem to get over this stuff in my, in my chest. And there's other fun stuff going on. All I can tell you is, and I, I'm starting to see some white in the beard there, uh, brother. So oh. you're not all that far behind me. Um, <laughs> but um, man, after after the after the first letter, first number turns to six, everything falls apart. That's just all there that's is. It, to huh? it. So that's it. Um, that's how it goes. So, yeah, prayers appreciate. It. I appreciate. It. All right, no problem, Doctor White. Go get some rest, man. I'm gonna let you go. All right, take care. God bless. Thank you. God bless. All right. All right, guys, another fantastic show in the books. And I know that there were some super chats that came flying in. Um, like I tell everyone, uh, whenever we, um, you know, we are not able to get the super chats, there is a portal. Um, I don't know the portal off the top of my head, but there's a portal where you can uh, ask for a refund uh, for your funds, right? Um, if you say, well, I didn't get my question asked, so I want my money back. No so off on back, no hard feelings. I totally get it, totally understand. But if you do decide to uh, uh, hold on and say, you know what, Marlon, go ahead, keep it. Just know that it's going to a great ministry. That is, you're gonna use the funds for the glorification of God, right? So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, but sorry, uh, couldn't get to him. Dr. White has been up. Uh, if you didn't know, he went to a conference. He's at a conference right now, the Open Air Theology, uh, Why Calvinism Conference right now. And he spoke today. And so he also had two debates maybe about a week or so ago. And so you can imagine a man of his age and he's pulling a, uh, a fifth wheel um, trailer uh, in his travel. So he's not flying, he's driving all over the place. So you can imagine the amount of uh, stress and amount of fatigue that he is experiencing um, as of right now. Um, what is... What is this? Hey, Marlon, do you know much about intention? Have you been trying to get some more information about for us? Wow. Nah, Alex, um, I see your question, Alex, but I don't know. I don't know too much about that, buddy. Uh, I'm sorry, man. I'm not sure about that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Dr. White um, has uh, been traveling a lot. And so that's why I didn't want to keep him too long. It was, it was originally supposed to be for like an hour and a half. Um, so that's why he, you know, he gave, that's what it was originally planned for an hour and a half. He actually went over that by about 10 minutes or so. Um, so I am thankful for the time he was able to give to, give to the gospel truth. And uh, I hope you guys got a lot out of this, right? I mean, I mean, he came on, he gave like a, a straight up church history lesson you know, of what was going on. Um, and if you guys were not following what he was saying, I think if we had, if we were able to like sort of summarize everything that he was saying into maybe one sentence, two sentences, that the reason that we had the, this situation or the belief of, of what they believe prior to the Nicene Creed, uh, the Nicene Council, should I say, um, was because of the lack of develop, the lack of resources, one being the full biblical text, right? Um, and how that could have 
uh, influenced the positions that many individuals had during that time of church, a uh, church history. Um, so that played a factor in it. The fact of persecution and the fact that Rome went out their way to try to destroy everything that was Christian played a factor into uh, the lack of development of a theological position in during that time. Um, so all these different and um, all these different elements and variables definitely played a factor in the the of what some individuals and during that time believe. Um, and so I know a lot of people uh, do hold to uh, a position that though some of them would have held to during the time prior to the, the, the Nicene Council. And to that, I say you need to come out of that because you're not in the same situation that those individuals were in during that time of what they believed. They didn't have Pauline's writings like that, right? Um, so they didn't have a lot of the things that we have today. So those who call themselves reaching back into history and saying, I'm going to believe what they believe prior to the Nicene Council. Well, you are in a bad spot. You have, you're, you're not in a proper spot. Um, you're, you're placing yourself in a context that where you don't belong because now we have, they, we have the full scriptures. We have Pauline, the Pauline epistles. We have all the full writings that clearly articulate the Trinitarian understanding of God. And so, uh, by you taking a step back and saying, well, you think you're doing yourself justice by stepping back into, um, into the second century, you know, uh, and prior to the Nicene Council and saying, look, I believe what they believe. Well, you're wrong because <laughs> what they believe was not necessarily based on a full council of God. They didn't have everything that we have today. And so basically, if we come to the understanding that if we come to the conclusion that the Trin Trinity is false and we think we're sort of, we're, we think we're sort of, you know, doing it the right way. Well, uh, we're, we're in a bad spot. Right, we're in a bad spot, and just so you guys know, that is a gospel issue, right? Uh, you can't reject the person of God in the Trinitarian sense, and then think you're okay. Uh, that is a gospel issue, issue big time. And so, um, make sure you guys understand that, man. I think that's sort of what some what, what Dr. White was getting at um, when he was giving us the rundown of this history, of the history, the persecution, uh, the lack of all the books of the scriptures, all the Bibles, all the letters, Pauline epistles, things like that, is that those guys back in the day, they didn't have the information that we have. They didn't have the plethora of, of doctrine that we have, right? They didn't, they didn't not doctrine, but the plethora of, of yeah, information that we have. They did his explanation. Um, even in that, I think that he, he able to explain the reasons why this is even a concept, right? Why the reasons why we even have to talk about this, right? And so, I, 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 even in that, I think that he really explained, really explained it, right? Really explained what was going on during that time, and and just to piggyback off Dr. Wright, um, the idea of being fair to uh, those who were uh, living in that time. Um, and not to put unfair barriers or, or situations on them and trying to apply us or our 21st century lenses um, onto them, you know? Um, and obviously that would be totally unfair to do. That'd be a totally unfair thing to do. And we should um, we should steer clear of doing it because it obviously wouldn't be. But all that said, Thanks guys for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth, man. It has been a joy, and I can, I can, I can say that I have finally got Dr. White on the Gospel Truth. That is such a blessing, and I am glad I'm able to say that because Dr. Tr Dr. White, as you guys have heard me say, is a theological hero of mine, theological hero of mine, right? And he's done a lot. I read his books. Um, I read his, 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 his articles and he is definitely, I watched the dividing line, right? Um, and so I, I am definitely, definitely, uh, grateful for Dr. Wright. All right. Um, with that said, I'm going to get out of here and I thank you guys once again for joining me on this episode of the gospel truth, because it was a fantastic one. A fantastic. 
fantastic one. And make sure that you guys are subscribing to The Gospel Truth. Do not walk away from this channel without subscribing to The Gospel Truth and hit that notification bell so you miss out any episodes, any debates, interviews, commentaries, anything like that, all right? Anything like that. And um, yeah, you know, look out for all the shows are coming up here in the future. Um, and funny thing is that I was gonna ask Dr. Wright, like, hey, one of your debates, man, you know, he said that, I don't know, if you, could, if you guys didn't catch Dr. White early, he did talk about that he may hang it up at the 200 point, but he may go to 250. He just doesn't know when he's gonna retire. But nonetheless, um, I'm sure that's on his mind. And um, I, I wanna see if he could do one of the debates on my show before he retires. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to try to get him to do it. Anyway, you guys take care. I'll talk to you soon. May God bless you and may God keep you.